John's gospel shows us uh, so many things that happened in the life of Jesus. I've said this several times during our studies in John that it would be impossible to cover every miracle that Jesus did or all of the details of his ministry. In fact, we do not have an accurate record of everything. When I say accurate, I meant a full record of everything. The record we have is accurate. It's just that it doesn't cover every miracle and every message and everything that Jesus did. Uh, the Gospels show us the events of Jesus' life from his birth to his ascension back to the Father. It also talks about his return. Uh, I'm glad that Jesus gave us an insight to that in his ministry that he told us that he was coming back. And we have that uh, hope within us and anticipation that one of these days we will see him again. Praise the Lord. In the New Testament, we're given many revelations of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed Savior of the world. Yeah. Those words are full of meaning if you know what they mean. He was anointed by God, chosen by God to do the work that he came into this world to do. These gospels, this message tell us of his anointing, his ministry, and his miracles. John chapter 9 tells of one of the most significant miracles in Christ's ministry. Now, there are several of them, but this is a very significant miracle, that a man that was born blind was healed. Yes. It's quite significant. Uh, usually, there is no hope for sight in someone who has never had that optic nerve and brain connection to the eye. Uh, something was wrong in the birth process. The man never saw. John chapter 9 presents this miracle in Christ's ministry and his life. Each one of his miracles show us something of his deity. And really that's why we have this record is to show us that Jesus is the Christ. Yes, That's one of the reasons why I titled this series The Revelation of Jesus Christ is as we look at these things that Jesus did, we have this testimony that gives us proof that Jesus is the Son of God. There are five things that declare the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody know them without looking at your notes? They are the virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles, his vicarious suffering for others, and number five, his bodily resurrection from the dead. Those five things you should, you should put to memory because they tell us above everything else that Jesus is the Son of God. Healing is a fascinating and important subject for divine healing or for Christ's deity. <coughs> uh, as we look at these things, we realize that Jesus Christ is not just a normal man. Now in the Old Testament, we saw many miracles take place uh, with the prophets. Uh, there are some of them that were very notable miracles that took place in their, in their ministry, in their life. I think of some that even raised the dead. Uh, Jesus enters into his ministry in the same vein as Elijah, and he, uh, he was a man of great power, great power with God. But Jesus is different than Elijah or Samuel or Elisha or Moses. He is the son of God, and that sets him apart. And these miracles, these actions that took place, his virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles, his vicarious suffering. Vicarious means suffering for somebody else. He did not deserve to die. He took our shame for our sins and his bodily resurrection proved that Jesus is the son of God. Hebrews chapter nine and verse 27. As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. 
From the moment that we are born until the day that we die, we start experiencing some decay. Yes. Yes. And after you reach so many years, <laughs> the decay starts uh, manifesting more. Yes. Some of us have some aches and pains in our bodies that we never thought we would have. Can I have a witness? Amen. <clears throat> Healing is an integral part of Christ's ministry, and yes. I believe that we cannot really have, truly have the ministry of Christ, the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, if it does not include divine healing. Mm -hmm. He is not only our savior, he is our healer. Now, we all do many things to resist, delay, uh, stop this dying and decaying process. In fact, I was reading something last night. Uh, it's in, the, in my news app on my phone. It has advertisements about every other uh, piece of news. And one of the advertisements was telling people how to get rid of the bags under their eyes. And, and that's just another one of those things that we do to try to stop the decaying process, the dying process. Uh, many people are em employed in the healing arts and there's all different kinds of them. Have you noticed that? Yes. And when people get tired of trying one, they try another because we do not like the decaying process. We do not like the dying process. We have doctors and hospitals and medical schools that work in this field of trying to bring healing. They, they try to st stop or slow down or arrest this. I, re I remember the first chiropractor that I ever went to, he, he came into the room and he, he said, look at these hands. He said, these are healing hands. <laughs> I didn't believe him. <laughs> in fact when he got finished with me I was certain they were not healing hands <laughs> uh -huh. there are basically four types of healing first there is natural healing when the body rebuilds itself how many of you have ever had a splinter in your hand and it festered and it got real sore Natural healing occurs in our body when uh, a virus or a sickness or uh, an attack of some kind of foreign body gets in us and our body was built by its creator who is God to have natural healing properties. That's right. These things are natural processes that God has set in us, natural immunities, and healing properties that every one of us have. Those healing properties are something that every one of us depend on. I, have you ever had an ingrown toenail? <laughs> and you were glad when the thing stopped hurting. Isn't it wonderful that you didn't have to cut off your toe because you had an ingrown toenail? I mean, it healed over a process of time. God has placed in us these natural healing properties. There's also medical healing. I thank, I thank God for medical practitioners. I don't see anything in the word of God that tells us to not go to the doctor or, or have nurses or, or take medicine. I know when I was a child, there was a, a large amount of preaching going on that you should not take medicine. And there are still some people that believe that. I remember uh, we had an evangelist one time that took aspirin is what he called them. Uh, and uh, there were people in the church that he thought he was uh, backslid because he took aspirin. <laughs> uh, but, you know, medical practitioners have limits on what they can do. Yes. I'm sure some of you have had surgery uh, or multiple surgeries. 
You know, doctors can cut out what's wrong, but it really gets back to that first level of healing that your body has to mend itself. Uh, they can make the wound, they can remove the infection or the, the bad part, but after they have done all that they can do, they depend upon your body to, to heal itself. They will do whatever it is they can. They will give you the medicines, the antibiotics, the, the fluids, the, the right kinds of food, the good rest, so that you can experience some healing in your body. Third, there's psychological healing. In medicine, it's called psychotherapeutic healing. Now, I know some people have had bad ideas about people who have psychological or psych psycho <laughs> analytic issues. Uh, but I would imagine uh, that there is more of this than what we think. Mayo Clinic a few years ago said 80 to 85 percent of all their patients were either in reality or artificially there because of mental stress. Wow. Uh, have you know? Have you ever had a doctor ask you, "Are you stressed?" <laughs> I, I have. Uh, in fact, most of the time when you go in for a physical, at mm -hmm. your age, <laughs> <laughs> yes. whatever that is, they will ask you, "Are you stressed? Do you have stress in your life?" Mm -hmm. uh, and it's amazing the numbers of people that because of stress, they cannot handle the issues that they face in life. Now, I know some people have not wanted to admit the fact that they have those kinds of issues. They try to cover it up. It's just as real as any other physical issue that we can have. And I think we need to put aside the, the stigma of I have a, a psychological or a psych, uh, psychotic problem because those things are real and they can cause all kinds of issues. That's right. Physical issues, very real issues in a person's body and life. Yes. Uh, the good news is there is healing in that area yes. of our lives. And I, I want to tell you that the Lord is interested in bringing healing to our minds and our spirit, our thoughts, as well as the other part of our body. And fourth, and this is the area that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, is divine or miraculous healing. Now, I, I know, and I... I I think I have a very good illustration of this. Noreen's brother was born without a pallet in his mouth, and God had called him into the ministry. He could not talk so that people could understand him. And he went through high school and went into Bible school. He knew God had called him into the ministry. It wasn't until he was in Bible school that a professor in Bible school said, I know someone that can help you. And they developed a, a pallet for him and after an artificial pallet, and when he would put that in, he could be understood. He went on and started many churches in the Assemblies of God. Uh, it, in some ways, it was a healing for him. It wasn't a divine healing. A divine healing would have been he was prayed for and all of a sudden what was not there was there. But for him, it, it changed his life and gave him the ability to do what God had called him to do. Now, many of us have experienced healings in our life and some of those healings we attribute to God when, and I, please bear with me, when it was natural healing, or we took an aspirin <laughs> and we got rid of our headache, and then we said, well, God healed me. Well, in, in the real sense, all healing 
belongs to God. Right. God is the one that gave your body the ability to be healed. Yes. But there are some miracles that are specifically so supernatural that they cannot be uh, assigned to anything else other than God healed me. This is the situation in this uh, story tonight. I want to tell you that this is part of Jesus' ministry. We've read this verse many times to you. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. It's interesting to me that in, in the assignment of what it was that God had sent him to do, anointed him to do, it covers all kinds of situations, healing of body parts and also oppression and spiritual issues and brokenheartedness. All of these things the Lord is interesting, interested in ministering to. There is a type of healing that by the very nature of it demands something supernatural to occur. Otherwise, it could not happen. God is a supernatural God. And God has done so many supernatural. And when I say supernatural, what I mean is they're beyond the natural ability of man. Yes, amen. We could never, we cannot even conceive how it can be done. I can go a step farther. Even the angels of heaven are not able to do what God can naturally do. That's right. And in, in that sense, it is supernatural events. God has the ability to do things that actually alter or change the natural course of events to accomplish whatever it is he desires and wants to do. Jesus was able to do many things that set aside basically the laws of nature. Think about it. He walked on water. Yes, he, did. he called the dead out of the grave. Mm -hmm. He fed multitudes with loaves and fishes. Yes. Uh, Jesus uh, turned water into wine. You look at those events and they are they are by nature supernatural in, in the defini definition of what it was that was done. Although Jesus did this, it did not become a normal activity. I never have read of any wedding after that one where people brought in bottles of water and poured it out and it was wine. Never have I read of multitudes of people being fed by a few biscuits and fish. And never have I heard of people walking on what Peter never tried it again to my knowledge. After the one time he said, that's enough. <laughs> you know, there are, there are some of these things that you look at it and you say, Wow, I can't believe that that happened. It was a supernatural event. It was a miracle that took place because Jesus the Christ was present. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. It was an amazing thing. Lazarus lived a normal life after he was raised from the dead. But Lazarus did not have eternal life if he went back to a natural form of life after he was resurrected and Lazarus had to die again. I can imagine, I, I'm just speaking my heart, my human humanity, that Lazarus was sort of upset <laughs> to already be in paradise and be called back and have to go through it again. But the good thing is he knew where he was going. <laughs> He had a testimony, you know, I know what it's like to go there and to come back and I'm going back again. I'm going to be with God. Yes. Uh, God's word is a book of miracles. In fact, you can start in the very beginning in Genesis and you see that by the word of God, everything that is came into existence. And this is an amazing thing to me that God did not have to do a lot of things 
to cause. He was the causative factor in the creation of things by the word of his mouth. God is so powerful that he can speak and that that is not comes into existence. Yes. That's hard to conceive, isn't it? Uh, we have trouble even controlling our children sometimes with the word of our mouth. <laughs> so we see that God is a supernatural God. He is, he is called Almighty God for the reason that God does things that is beyond our natural abilities to do. We find that even things that are what we would call more normal attributes or characteristics of God are supernatural in, in their uh, fulfillment or manifestation. God's love. Yes. Can you imagine a love that is so powerful that would save a world? Can you imagine mercy and grace? I mean, you, be, you begin looking at the things of, of God, the things that define God as who he is. And as you start looking at that, you have to say, God is not a man. That's right. He is above man. Mm -hmm. He is above the angels. Yes. Uh, and in all of this, we look at God and we see that God is able to do things that are unusual and impossible as far as man is concerned. But for God, these things are, are normal. God is, I believe that God can still, I don't think it just stopped in Genesis. I believe God could still at any moment say, let there be another star. I believe God is able to uh, create anything and everything that would go through his imagination. The desire of God's heart. There is no limit to God's ability. Uh, when I look at this and I begin to think about the things throughout the scripture, I see that God is an unusual supernatural, almighty being who is different than we are. If you believe in God, you have to believe in miracles. In fact, if you remove miracles from the Bible, you're going to have to remove God from the Bible because almost every time you see a manifestation of God, you see something that is supernatural occurring. Right. such as God comes down on Sinai and the mountain quakes at his presence and looks like it's on fire. God comes down for the children of Israel, feeds them with manna. He walks with them through the wilderness and a pillar of fire. God's manifestations are always supernatural as far as we are concerned. I don't think that it is unusual at all for God to dwell in his holiness and in his power. In fact, every time anyone has seen God, they has, have seen what we would call the Shekinah glory or the radiant fire of God. God our God is a consuming fire, yes. but he's more than fire. Right. When Jesus healed this man, it was not one of those natural processes. It was not a medical healing or a psychotherapy, therapeutic healing. It was a divine miracle. This man was blind in both of his eyes and instantaneously his eyes who had, that had never seen were able to see. It was such an unusual thing that many that saw it balked at it and said, we don't understand this. How can this be that a man born blind is able to see? Jesus Christ had absolute and total divine miracle power. He could do this. He could raise the dead because of the anointing of the spirit and because of who he was. 
It was created, this miracle was a creative healing power manifested through Jesus Christ. It was in the divine will of God the Father that this man who was born blind would receive his sight at this time. So what is the result of this miracle on the crowds? Now we just saw in chapter eight, when Jesus began showing his deity to them, that they picked up stones and were ready to to kill him. Uh, We have artificial breaks in stories in our Bibles. Uh, When it was originally happening, it did not say chapter eight verse (laughs) and chapter nine verse. Those things were written so that it's easier for us to find them. Uh, When it happened, it went from one event to the next. So Jesus was uh, walking through the midst of the people with them having stones in their hands. And while he was walking through the midst of the people, Jesus saw this man that was born blind. He knew that he was born blind. Uh, There is something about, about divine knowledge here. Jesus knew the man was born blind and he stopped and healed him. Now this is a very critical moment in the Gospel of John because it begins a transition. When the people refuse to receive what Jesus does with this man, Jesus turns from the crowds and he starts ministering to the little people, to the smaller groups of people. I want you to look at four aspects of this healing. First of all, notice the problem. After Jesus hid himself and went out himself and went out of the temple through the midst of them, he saw the blind man. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. I want to remind you, and I've told you this many years now, that with God, nothing just happens. All right. You need to live by that. With God, nothing just happens. It's important for us in our lives to come to this peace in our heart and not be troubled when things don't work the way that we thought they ought to work. Even though Jesus was among a crowd of people that were ready to stone him, he had time to stop and minister to someone who was in trouble. See, this is the nature and character of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did this often. Uh, Many times he would be walking down the street, going from one place to another, and he would stop and heal people. Sometimes it was because they would cry out, Lord, help me. Other times it was just because Jesus showed compassion on people. There were other times Jesus went completely out of his way, like the woman at the well or the man at the pool. Uh, He went out of his way to minister to them. Even while Jesus was being crucified, he he was willing at that time while he was dying for the sins of mankind to reach over to a man, I say reach, by, by faith. He reached over and saved a man who was dying on the cross next to him and he told him, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was conscious of everybody else's need even though as a human being, he was going through trauma himself. In the Bible, blindness quite often is pictured as not only physical, but a spiritual component. So that if a person was blind in their eyes, they also attributed a spiritual darkness to that individual. This man was blind and I believe was in spiritual darkness as well. In the same way that a sinner is at the mercy of Jesus Christ, so this man was at the mercy of the Lord. We don't hear in the story that the man called out for Jesus to stop and heal him. In fact, I don't know that the man even knew that Jesus was right there in front of him. How could he? He was blind. He didn't see him. The crowd was ready to kill him. And Jesus stopped in the throng, in the mob, and said to him what to do. So here he is. Jesus is showing mercy and grace and love to this man. 
As Jesus is walking through the mob, I, I, I want to stop you in your life. Regardless of what it is that you're going through, the Lord is never too busy to interrupt what is going on to minister to you. Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever pondered it? That when you are praying, that God is watching over the whole world? Yeah. Have you ever thought about that? Why would God, the God who's watching over the whole world, why would he pay attention to my need? It's because God is love and God is full of mercy. And his love and his mercy and his grace is supernatural. It's not like ours. God is able to reach past the boundaries that other people would not be able to. Yeah. Verse number two of John 9. His disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, why would they ask a question like that? Rabbis at that time were teaching that all suffering, any sickness, was a direct result of sin. Somebody had to sin. In fact, I have pastored churches where people within the church, though it wasn't the whole church, but people within the church had the theology, the idea, the doctrinal belief that if you were sick, you had to have sinned. So if you're wearing glasses, you had to have sinned. If you go to the dentist, you had to have sinned. If you had a heart problem, there has to be sin in your life. Isn't that a terrible idea? Uh, I understand that sun sickness is a direct result of sin, that we do something wrong and it brings these things on us. But not all sickness is a result of sin. And you need to know that. These rabbis were teaching that somebody had to sin and they thought they were, their, their, their idea was that either the, the son sinned or the parents sinned so that this boy was born blind. And here's, here's another factor of that. They believed that it was possible for a child to sin while in the womb. And they taught this. There is nothing biblical. It was an imagination of their mind because it fit with their philosophy. If sin is the cause of all sickness, then somebody has to sin. If it wasn't the parents, then it had to be the kid. And it, if, if it's the child and he's born blind, then he had to sin in the womb. See the reasoning. Isn't that silly? So the disciples asked, who sinned? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Stop a minute, and I want you to think about that. That the works of God may be revealed in him. He was not blind because of sin. God had prepared him for a moment. Now I know some people have a real problem with this concept. It's a truth that the Lord had prepared this man for this moment. I know it, it, it boggles our mind. Why would this man have to go blind for all of those years for this moment? But Jesus says that it was, he was prepared for this moment so that the works of God may be manifest in him. See what ha the, the bigger story is, and I think a lot of people miss this, the bigger story in our life is not our comfort. The bigger story is that God would be glorified by the things that happen in our life. That's right. See, that's really what God wants to do in all of our lives is that there are moments in time and this moment in time, I believe, was a divine appointment where this young man was at the right place at the right time that Jesus was there at the right time. God had appointed that moment for him to be healed in the front, in front of everyone so that they would see who Jesus really is. Yes. There's a message there. 
The miracles that God ordains always bring glory to God. That's really the reason why miracles take place. Miracles take place so that someone will get glory and it's not you. It's that God the Father will be glorified. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Some versions say we must work. What Jesus is saying, we don't have much time. I think Jesus is cognizant of the fact that he did not have many more days until his crucifixion. But there's also another message and it involves every one of us. Our time is short. What you're going to do for God, you need to be busy doing it. None of us have the assurance that we have hundreds of years to labor. You know, you can't put off until tomorrow what it is that God has ordained for you to do today. I have known in my life there are some moments in time. This is one of the reasons why I, as a pastor, try and I encourage you to do the same thing. Don't just wait on me to do it. Anytime someone says, I'm not feeling well, stop. Arrest your motivation to get out and go to lunch or to go and do what you need to do. If you're at the grocery store and somebody you know says, I'm not feeling well, stop and say, can I pray for you? It's a divine appointment. God put you in their life at that moment for a reason. And it may be, I, I don't know the numbers of times, and I one just flew through my mind. We were pastoring. I had a radio program. I'd had a radio program in that town for, I, I had one for ultimately 14 years. Everybody in town knew my voice. We were talking, headed into a pharmacy, and a lady in the parking lot heard us talking, and she said, you're Pastor Anderson. Would you pray for me? And I stopped what we were doing and we prayed in the parking lot and God ministered to her need and I believe that she received a change. Mm -hmm. One other that hits my mind, we were eating at a Mexican food restaurant and uh, two pastors from other churches, one was a Baptist and one was a Nazarene, came over to me and they said, can we pray for you? Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. And they stood up in the aisles in the Mexican food restaurant and talked as loud as I'm talking to you. Everybody in the restaurant heard them praying for pastor. I don't know if it was for me, really, but everybody in the room, <laughs> everybody in the room got something from God, whether they wanted it or not. It was a divine appointment. John chapter nine and verse six. Verse five, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Uh, Jesus was saying, we have something that we have to do. He said, I am the light of the world. And as long as I'm here, I need to do the things that I've been sent to do. And so now Jesus is going to touch this man's eyes, these sightless eyes, and open them and create sight where there had never been sight. And all of a sudden, this man who was blind was going to have the light of the day for the first time in his life. In verse uh, 38, Jesus said he gave him more than just the light to see the day. He came and gave him salvation in his soul, the light for his soul. The man said to him at that time, Lord, I believe. And he fell down and worshiped the Lord. Second was the purpose for the healing. What is the purpose for the healing? Jesus said it was for the glory of God. I've already uh, dealt with that just a little bit, but let me touch one more time. If you have a need in your body, 
You need to make sure that it's not to be consumed upon your own lust, but that it's for the glory of God. Some people, I had a lady one time tell me, she said, pray for me that I would be healed so that I can go and do what I want to do. <laughs> she wasn't healed. Third, look at the power. Verse six, when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Uh, there are several ideas about what happened. I need to share these with you because some, somewhere along the line you may face these. One commenter, commentor said, Jesus wanted to make use of healing, the healing quality of saliva. So he put saliva in the man's eyes. Another said it symbolized that the man was made from dirt. A third said he was delaying the crowd so that they would scatter. Another said he wanted to give the man's time, man's eyes time to heal, so he put the clay in his eyes. Another said that he made eyeballs out of the clay and put them in the sockets. There's a lot of craziness in this world. Amen. Do you know why Jesus did it? He wanted to. I believe there's another point, and it, it's the same thing that happens when we anoint with oil. There is no healing virtue in when anointing oil. It's just olive oil. In fact, you could use Crisco. <laughs> I don't recommend it. <laughs> the oil is just oil. What Jesus was doing was giving this man an assignment of faith. And it's the same thing that James talks about. Call for the elders of the church and let them anoint with oil and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. The the exercise is an exercise of faith. I've seen this many times throughout my life in ministry and in the church, sometimes outside of my ministry, a lot of times outside of my ministry. I remember uh, many times when I was a child, uh, someone would say, walk to the back of the church and walk back up. And they'd walk to the back and they'd walk back up. And sometime in the process of walking, they were healed. I, I've seen times, and I, I've seen this myself, that I've asked people, come to the front if you want to be healed. They got out of their pew. It was an exercise of faith. They left their comfort zone, and they moved to a place that was less comfortable for them. And in the process, even before I got to them to pray, they were healed. I believe that is what's going on here. Jesus put mud in his eyes and told him to go and wash. Verse number seven. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed his eyes, washed and came back seeing. So this man was healed by the power of Jesus Christ as he responded in faith. In Genesis, Jesus is God who spoke the universe into existence. I believe that Jesus could have said to the man, receive your sight, and he would have received his sight. So why did he send him to the pool of Siloam? There's a hidden message here that's one of those hidden nuggets that I think will help you. Hezekiah built an aqueduct, a tunnel underneath the city that went from a water source, a spring, and fed water to the pool of Siloam. In the Old Testament, it was called Shiloh. It is called Siloam in the Greek, and it means sent. Here's the message. From the Temple Mount, the water was sent to the pool. Now there's more to it than that. The Temple Mount is the place where God's presence is. So from the presence of God comes water that is sent that he is to be washing in. Here's the bigger message. 
Jesus Christ presents living water to those that will receive. Isn't that a good sideline? Verse number seven again. He said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is not this he who sat and begged? Now, you would think, wouldn't you, that everyone would be excited about what happened, that this blind man was healed. Verse number nine. Some said, this is the other said, he is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes open? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. Uh, can you imagine? I, I think if everybody in the crowd knew who he was, the community knows the, the beggars. I mean, even in a city this size, you pass some that are on the curb, and after a while, you recognize them. You may not know them by name, but you recognize that's the one who has the sign that said, we'll work for food, or have been out of a job, uh, whatever. And you begin to recognize them. Now they look at him and they say something has happened to him. He's, he looks like the same one, but we don't think he is because this man is seeing. So how did they respond? Well, some of them got upset and they said, the audacity of Jesus healing on the Sabbath. <laughs> we ought to get rid of him. He's a sinner. They called him a sinner because he healed on the Sabbath day. And they told the man that he was completely born in sins. And here's what they did. They excommunicated him from the community and from the temple because he was healed. And because he gave testimony that Jesus healed him. You see, in, in the world, and this is true in our world today, even there are some people that because they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are excommunicated from their community. They are abused by their family because they believe. And it was after that happened that this man was found by Jesus and he offered him light for his soul. So Jesus gave him not only healing for his eyes, but healing for his whole being. I believe the Lord is still that healer. Yes, he is. Uh, 